Good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, Common Spirit Grand Rounds from the Physician Enterprise. And I'm really excited for a conversation that we're going to have today uh, on, on harm reduction um, and within the space of gun violence. So I know this is a uh, politically complicated topic, but I know we have some amazing speakers that are going to help us navigate this. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I see this as a, as a public health issue and how can we reduce, you know, the harm to our patients uh, in the most meaningful way. Um, and that, that's where at the heart of this conversation is about. So I'm going to turn this introductions and teeing this conversation up. Dr. Sagar, who is our vice president of um, clinical, standards. Clinical, standards. clinical standards. Thank you. I'm always <laughs> messing up your title. Yeah. So, no all right, Dr. Sagar, take it away. Thank you, Dr. McGinn. Uh, welcome, everybody. We just want to, before I introduce our phenomenal speakers this morning, uh, John, can we just put up that slide for ground rules uh, to make sure we have a really good conversation? Wanted to make sure that we come to this with open minds. We're all here to learn. There's a lot of information out there that we can engage respectfully on. We do ask everybody to reflect on the information that's being shared. Let's continue this dialogue beyond the conversation today. Um, Want to make sure this is not a debate. It's really supposed to be an engaging dialogue in which we can all be humble and listen carefully with an ear to understanding everybody's views and avoid comparing our experiences to those of our patients, but really come to it, as Dr. McGinn said, with the hope to improve patient care as well as our communities at large. So thank you, John. Okay, I am excited to introduce our speakers this morning. We have Dr. Mark Shapiro, who is a practicing hospitalist and is the creator, producer, and host of the Explore the Space podcast a show focused on bringing those who provide healthcare and those who seek healthcare closer together through open conversations with leaders from across the spectrum. He is also a TEDx speaker, delivering his first TEDx in March of 21, and is a co-author of COVID-19 CV Matrix, published in the Journal of Hospital Medicine and the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. He's also the winner of the I Stand With Her Award in 2021 from the Women in Medicine Summit. Dr. Shapiro is a full-time clinical practice as a hospitalist since 2006, has been working with Providence Medical Group in Sonoma County since 2016. Since joining the medical group, he has served both as the hospitalist medical director and member of the board of directors. He earned his BA in history at University of California, Los Angeles, attended medical school at Baylor College of Medicine, and completed his internal medicine residency at UC. Uh, San Diego. He is an active voice in social media, which is how him and I connected. And he can be followed on Twitter at ETS Show, Instagram at Explore the Space Show, and on LinkedIn. I also very excited to introduce Lara Krause, who serves as the System Director of Advocacy Programs and has worked in violence prevention for Common Spirit Health for over 14 years directing the organization's United Against Violence Initiative, which is a multifaceted initiative that addresses the complex issue of violence using comprehensive strategy, public policy advocacy, shareholder advocacy, education and awareness, and community-based violence prevention. In her time with Common Spirit, she assisted communities in addressing child abuse, bullying, youth violence, interpersonal violence, family violence, human trafficking, group involved violence, and of course, firearm related violence. She's a co-author of Common Spirit's community-based violence prevention model and guide, which is a framework for supporting individual communities to develop their own unique solutions to violence. So I welcome Dr. Shapiro, take it away, and then we will come back as a panel to have an engaging discussion. Thank you so much. I'm just gonna get my screen loaded up here. I appreciate that kind introduction, Ankit, that I'm, I'm really honored to be here with all of you this morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, the title of my talk, Things I Didn't Learn in Training About Firearms. Um, <clears throat> a couple of quick objectives in, the, in our next 20 to 25 minutes. We're going to work to understand the implications of the Dickey Amendment. Some of you may be familiar with the Dickey Amendment. Some of you may not. 
We're going to learn a little bit about secure storage and techniques to speak with patients about it. We'll have a little bit of time, and I think more also in the uh, uh, panel discussion around embracing our roles as physicians and healthcare providers in dealing with, as Dr. McGinn said, the public health emergency of gun violence in the United States. <clears throat> My disclosures, I have no relevant financial disclosures. Everything here is open source material. As Ankita said, I am very active on social media. If you want to live tweet or take screenshots and share them later on social media, that's fine. It's always great if you can tag me. I'm at ETS show on Twitter because then down the road I can engage as well. And that always kind of helps keep the conversation going and keeps the voltage kind of high. And so let's start just a little bit of context. And I don't share all of this to give you more rundown of my CV, but just to set a little bit of temporal context. And I'll invite all of you to kind of think about where your training fits in with this milieu, because some of these years are a little important as, we'll, as we go forward in our discussion. I finished at Baylor in 2003. So medical school was 1999 to 2003. Residency was 03 to 06 at UC San Diego. And in the title of the talk, you'll notice I used the word learn instead of taught. And in thinking about firearms, when I was in Houston, Texas, in medical school, we saw a ton of, of firearm-related violence. Uh, every night at Ben Taub, every day in Ben Taub, we were responding to you know, multiple traumas and going to the recess room and managing them on the inpatient service. And it was extraordinarily traumatic for all of us as, prov as providers. And I'm sure a lot of you can reflect on your training and perhaps your clinical practice now around the, the deluge of, of firearm-related injury. Uh, firearm-related death, and then the, the ripple effect that it has on families, friends, and communities. It was, there was a lot of conversation around, you know, where to put the chest tube and how much blood do we give and these sorts of things. There was never any conversation around why is this happening? What is actually going on? Why are these weekends so fraught? Uh, and why are we just overwhelmed by this day after day after day? The messaging that, that I received in my training, both implicit and explicit, was we don't talk about this. Uh, because none of the people whom we were learning from as role models and as teachers and as guides were never talking about it, there was a message there that we just don't talk about this. Um, if you asked about it, there was very little to be shared, and oftentimes people may even shy away from the topic. There was a lot of narrative around this, you know, talking about firearms is political, therefore physicians should not weigh in, this is not our role, this is not our fight, get back to work, these sorts of things. And in parallel with that, there was the virtual absence of peer-reviewed studies and data and discussion. And for all the other topics, we were just, we had, we had everything we needed. Um, I trained, you know, medical school and residency was at the emergence of highly active antiretroviral therapy for HIV. We had grand rounds after morning report, afternoon conference on this stuff. And it was great. We learned a lot. We got really effective really quickly in using a very, very powerful tool that helps to save lives. In, in juxtaposition with firearms, we didn't have that. The one comment that I remember receiving in medical school was before Memorial Day weekend, and our professor said to the class, hope you all have a great weekend. I hope you remember <clears throat> half the people on the road this weekend have a firearm in their car, half of them are drunk, good luck. And I remember we looked at each other like, that can't be it. That, that's really the message we're going out on. And when I gave this talk at Baylor a few months ago, one of my friends from medical school that graduated with me, when I said that, I saw her face kind of light up. And afterwards, she's like, oh my gosh, Mark, I remember that. That, that actually happened. And, and so let's start with why this is. And the reason that we have this nebulous, multi-generational space of no conversation starts with this thing called the Dickey Amendment. We, if we start off at the beginning of this of this sort of tale, October 7th, 1993, this paper is published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Gun ownership as a risk factor for homicide in the home, not suicide, not accidental injury. Uh, it's for homicide. And the conclusion is rather than confer protections, guns kept in the home are associated with an increase in the risk of homicide by a family member or intimate acquaintance. So this is a really powerful, well-designed study uh, with by Dr. Kellerman and his team. He actually came on the pod, on Explore the Space podcast a few months ago to talk about all of this. They were really enthusiastic and they were really excited about what they found because the whole point of this is to make give people the opportunity to make informed decisions around what is safest for them. This also caused a backlash because there was a very there was for many years a very powerful lobby in the United States called the National Rifle Association, and the National Rifle Association promulgates marketing terms that fly in the face of what is found here with a rigorous scientific study. So this study was funded by the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control, NCIPC, which is part of the Centers for Disease Control. 
The National Rifle Association in response adopts the position that firearm-related injury research is, quote, research advocating gun control and anti-gun advocacy. And it's important to note, this is where we start to see the emergence of the term gun control in this narrative, the, the, the positioning of gun next to control. So initially, the NRA campaigned for the elimination of the NCIPC. It had support in the House of Representatives. This was just after the Republican Revolution of 1994, uh, when Newt Gingrich became Speaker of the House. That failed. But we're left with a place of uh, we're left with a place of the NRA telling people you can either do your research or you can keep your guns. But if you let the research go forward, you will lose all of your guns. And Dr. Rosenberg was the director of the NCIPC at the time. It's a very binary equation, right? It's this idea of you're either going to lose them all or you can do whatever you want, but you can't have it both ways. That's not what the that's not what we're looking for as physician scientists. But that was the that was the message that went out to the general public. It was a really, really interesting continuum from what the tobacco lobby had done around cigarettes. All of the stuff that they had done around marketing and uh, gaslighting and data that was very questionable and then just more and more and more marketing was exactly the playbook that was followed here up until one final step that was taken that the tobacco lobby was never able to do around uh, the dangers of cigarette smoking. 1996, uh, Congressman Jay Dickey from Arkansas puts the following language into the Omnibus Consolidated Appropriations Act. That's the money. Provided further, none of the funds made available for injury prevention and control at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention may be used to advocate and promote gun control. So as a history major, I had to go looking for it, and that's the Dickey Amendment. Page 244 of a 799-page document, two line, three lines, followed by a narrative around the Bureau of Mines. Um, and this was $2.1 million that had been earmarked for the CDC to conduct research around firearm injury prevention uh, that was then switched to, in, to research around traumatic brain injury. Dr. Kellerman and Rivara, who had written that paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, their comment precisely what or was not permitted under the clause was unclear, but no federal employee was willing to risk his or her career or the agency's funding to find out. Extramural support for firearm injury prevention research quickly dried up. So this is 1996 moving into 1997. This is a de facto gag order. This is basically people saying, we can't talk about this because we have no idea what the ground rules are and the stakes are extraordinarily high. We'll lose our jobs, our, our, our organizations will be closed down. We won't be able to do anything. So let's just make sure we do everything that we can around this, but we have to avoid the topic. It was extraordinarily powerful. 2009, Bronis et al. did publish this follow-on study from the National Institutes of Health investigating the link between gun prevention and gun assault. Again, users should reconsider their possession of guns or at least understand regular possessions necessitates careful safety countermeasures. Again, flies right in the face of narrative. And I'm sure many of you remember the really, really powerful narratives that have emerged in the beginning of the 21st century around firearms in the United States from the gun lobby. And the response to this was the Consolidated Appropriations Act in 2011. None of the funds made available in this title may be used in whole or in part to advocate or promote, and there's that term again, gun control. The Dickey Amendment is still on the books. It is still it is still active, but it was reinterpreted in 2018, and I think a lot of people remember that. That was front page news when it happened. The CDC can conduct research around gun violence, but cannot use government appropriated funds to specifically advocate for gun control. So it does allow, it does provide some clarity, but the term gun control is still a, uh, it's still a marketing term. It's still this sort of nebulous term um, but we have at least a better foothold and we begin to see the emergence of a lot more research since 2018. The ripple effect continued because of the Florida Firearms Owners Privacy Act 2011. It was passed into law in the state of Florida, effectively blocked healthcare professionals from asking patients and families firearm related questions. And that's important because as we get to it, you'll see the next part around secure storage and screening. Physicians in violation faced fines, sanctions or loss of their state license. Some of this may resonate with current events today. 14 other states tried to pass similar laws, 14, none of them passed. And in 2017, the Florida Firearms Owners Privacy Act was overturned by the 11th U.S. Circuit Court based on a lawsuit that was initially filed by the American Academy of Pediatrics. So here's our epilogue. As a consequence, U.S. scientists cannot answer the most basic question, what works to prevent firearm injuries? And this is the ripple effect from the Dickey Amendment. This is a long quote, and it's pulled from an article in the Washington Post, and it's there for your um, edification. It's worth reading. And here, here it is. It was an editorial in the Washington Post published July 27, 2012, in the aftermath of the Aurora Theater shooting. 
And the lead author is Congressman Jay Dickey. After he left office and 16 years later, he repudiated his own amendment. He repudiated the Dickey Amendment. And he went, he went public multiple times saying this was a terrible mistake. We should have never done it. We made it way too vague. We did not anticipate how far this was going to go. And now we're in this terrible place where we have no idea what prevents firearm injuries. And it's just all narrative. Is it better for everyone to be carrying? Is it better to have secure storage or not? Is it better to have high capacity magazines or not? No scientific rigor has been allowed to take place. No conversations have been allowed to take place. So now we have absolutely no idea. Nature abhors a vacuum. It will always be filled. And what has filled it is narrative. So now we move to the, where we are today. Firearm, gun violence in the United States is a public health emergency. That's not a debatable topic. Firearm homicides are up 33.4% in 2019-2020, uh, deaths in general increased 13.5%. Firearm-related deaths age 1 to 19 increased 29.5%. It's now the leading cause of death in America age 1 to 19 that is from, from firearms. This graph is a disgrace. This graph is a stain on all of us, quite honestly. Um, this is the graph that demonstrates that firearms are the leading cause of death in children in the United States. There's a bunch of other topics here. You can look at each one of them, and we have multi-dimensional multidisciplinary, well-funded, aggressive approaches to address all of them, except one. Now they come and go, and sometimes they're powerful and sometimes they're not. Um, and sometimes they're more effective depending on you know a whole different variety of circumstances. But this is on all of us. I mean, I have a six-year-old and I'm sure a lot of people in the audience have children. This is, this is the one that we have to look at and look into our hearts and souls and minds and say, this cannot stand. Um, this is not the country that we aspire to be and this is not life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, in the way that we learned it in school. And as medical professionals, we don't let things like this stand. So where do we begin? Each of us can and must start somewhere. And we have to start by shedding those outdated lessons and mindsets. I know a lot of people in the audience trained kind of in parallel with me in those years that I shared, probably you're kind of like, yeah, that was pretty close to me. And hopefully you had the opportunity to reflect a little bit on what kind of insights you were able to gather. There were for sure more you know, programs that were more forward facing around this, but I think all of us probably experienced some limitations around what we learned around firearms. And then the next place to start is talking with patients, friends, and their families around secure firearm storage as an injury prevention strategy, acknowledging that approximately 44% of Americans live in a home or residence where there is a firearm present, 44%. And then finally, it's selecting ways to use your megaphone. How do you want to use the privilege that comes with being a physician to interact with the public to educate? And this is absolutely our lane. This is a tweet that was put out by the National Rifle Association, November 7th, 2018. Many of you probably remember it. It was in response to an article that was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine um, around firearm injury prevention. And this tweet went out saying physicians need to stay in their lane. This caused an uproar. Uh, physicians from really all around the world responded. Uh, you can go and look at it and the, the ratio of replies is, is pretty staggering, but it was really inspiring to see so many physicians come out and say, this is all we do all day, every day, we absolutely need to be talking about this. We absolutely need to be educating around this and researching around this. So let's spend a few minutes just talking about secure storage. Secure firearm storage means that the firearm is unloaded, the firearm and the ammunition are separate, and the firearm is locked. Approximately 46% of gun owners report following this full spectrum of secure storage practices, and it is a continuum. You know, some is better than none, all is better than some. The firearm and the ammunition are, are, the firearm does not have weapon, ammunition in it, ammunition is separate, and the firearm is locked with what's called a gun lock. Some people may be familiar, some may not. A gun lock is basically something that can go around the trigger that prevents the trigger from being able to be, pull, be pulled back. The most common ones there are ones actually that look like a bike lock. A lot of police stations will give them away for free. Um, and when I, in Houston, Texas, you can call the district attorney's office and they'll give you one. I actually called the Santa Rosa Police Department. They don't have any. And when I called the Sonoma County Sheriff's Department, they're like, we run out. Um, we need to restock. There's been really, really high demand. I'm really sorry we don't have any, but we're out. Some hospitals are able to give them out. Some do not. Um, but the opportunity for improvement around this is really high. If you go on Amazon, the quality of them is, is variable and um, they're not ex they're, 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 they're expensive. So there's a couple of barriers, right? Most people don't want to call the police department. Most people don't want to call the sheriff or the district attorney's office um, just to get a gun lock. There are opportunities here for us to, as healthcare professionals, lower some of these barriers for people who are interested in getting one. And it's screening, right? We don't need to make this more complicated than anything else. 
we do a ton of screening as healthcare professionals, a ton. We do it all day on a variety of topics. This is no different. How frequently are we asking about firearms in the home and secure storage? Approximately half of your patients, based on data, live in a residence where there's a firearm present. And how comfortable do you feel answering questions, providing resources, and potentially dealing with resistance and frustration? It's not easy. When I was a resident, I was rounding with my attending, and the, dog, the family member said, can you please talk with my parent about their firearms? We're really worried about them. We don't think they should have them. There's some cognitive changes, and this is really concerning. We went in the room totally unequipped to have this conversation, both of us, and it did not go very well at all. It became very adversarial very, very quickly, and we didn't have the toolbox to move through it in, in a way that could have been a lot more productive. And I, that, I remember that one for sure. Do you know how to get a free gun lock for your patient? Does Common Spirit have programs around gun lock uh, 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 providing or things like that? And again, this is screening like anything else. We have the toolbox. So here's some language tips. If firearms are in your home, how are they stored? This is really good language. I actually got this from Dr. Kellerman because it doesn't suggest anything about ownership. It doesn't suggest anything about legality. It's just, are they there? Are they there? How are they stored? If they say they're stored safely, explore what that looks like. Because remember, secure storage is a three-step process. It's pretty complicated. So let's find out what they say. If it says, yeah, my gun is stored securely, it's in a shoebox under the bed. That's not a great secure storage practice as opposed to, yeah, everything is separate and I've got a gun lock and et cetera, et cetera. If they say no or they're unsure about secure storage, this is the opportunity for effective counseling. And you should encourage people to use those same questions with those whose homes they visit. One of the things that I'm trying to get much better at is now that we're all able to begin to socialize again as the pandemic continues to evolve is asking, hey, you know, family's going to get together. Let's all have a good time. Kids are going to play. Are there, is there a, a, a fence around the swimming pool? Is there a firearm in the home? Um, and the final thing, and this is really important, and I put it at the end for a reason, look for risk compounding factors. Look for a history of violence. Look for a history of substance use disorder <coughs> as well. These are the things that can precipitate that moment of friction that moment of pressure where an unsecured firearm becomes devastating. And so we want to make sure that we are having as much situational awareness as we can to really support our patients and their families the best that they can. This is any other type of screening, the language and the approach that we use for counseling and framing again, and I cannot emphasize this enough because it helps remove that sense of I'm out in the wilderness here and I don't know what I'm doing. It's exactly the same as any other type of screening that we do. Assess interest, Seek understanding of the unique context, offer concrete solutions that are doable if there is interest in receiving them at that visit, create shared understanding and goals, providing choices and follow up. If nothing happens in that first visit, they come back and you continue to work on it. Our goal here is, and this is really important, we don't have the power to take people's firearms away. We don't have that sort of opportunity to do something like that. That's, and we should be transparent about that. What we're looking for is the opportunity, just like with anything else, is to give people the risks and the benefits and help them to, and help support choices that are as safe as possible for them, for their families, and for their communities. This is like any other type of screening. That's a critical mindset for all of us to have as we try to build out this new skill set. And we're just getting started, right? If we think about all the stuff that's in the EHR about framing, about uh, about screening, whether it's you know Cerner, or Epic, or whichever. There's a lot, right? There's skin, there's colorectal cancer, there's all of the th all of the screening around diabetes. This stuff is shared publicly. You can access all of this data. The vast majority of EHRs configured for, for medical groups don't mention firearms at all, um, right? Leading cause of death, 44% uh, of Americans have them, 46% don't do any type of screening, uh, secure storage, and it's nowhere in our EHR. So we're not normalizing this yet. There's a lot of opportunities for us to become a lot more powerful around how we're doing this counseling and framing. Pay attention for communication barriers, right? Don't assume that the person, you know, this is where we need to make sure we have our translators, family members, whatever is necessary to make sure we facilitate communication if there's sensory neural hearing loss, all of those usual types of things, we have to pay more attention to it, acknowledging that when we bring this topic up, it may, it may elicit a response that we may not expect. Be mindful of your own implicit biases here. Be mindful of the way you, un you unconsciously respond to per people or circumstances based on your, the way you have grown up and seen the world. Be really careful about this, especially around firearms. This is a great place to do implicit bias training. So that, again, we don't walk into uh, a giant hole in the ground that we didn't see coming. 
And then use resources just as you would for any other type of screening. It works better for patients if it falls into sort of that syncopated pattern and rhythm that they're used to with the other types of screening that you've been doing. And this can absolutely be done in the hospital. This does not just need to happen in the office. This can absolutely be done in people who are hospitalized as well. Last piece here, avoid saying gun control. I actually learned this from Steve Kerr, who's the head coach of the Golden State Warriors. He came on Explore the Space podcast. And his experience was that when you go around the country and you talk about firearms, when you say gun control, you are automatically placing yourself into this sort of fever dream that was concocted towards the end of the 20th century around people or entities coming into your home and pulling your guns out of your hand. That's not what this is about. But when you use that term, you've lost the argument. You're nowhere. So we really want to be careful and avoid saying gun control because we are using terms from an argument we're not trying to make. And it's actually from the side that is uh, that that is <coughs> working to prevent us from trying to move the ball forward. So here's some other suggestions. Gun safety, reasonable firearm precautions, gun violence reduction, firearm risk reduction, firearm safety interventions. It's almost like, you know, word association. You put the words together in the way that feels authentic to you. But avoid saying gun control, because when you say that, you've lost the argument, you've lost the narrative, you are pivoting into something else completely, and that's not where you're trying to go. So that's my time, and I do want to get us to move to the panel. I am happy to answer any other questions, but I do like to end all of my talks with this. This is a QR code that takes you to vote.org. Everyone here needs to register to vote. Physicians and healthcare professionals register to vote and vote between 20 to 30 percent less than the general public. So if you're concerned about things being done, uh, around how we take care of patients and how we take care of our communities. Make sure your voice is heard. You can share this QR code with your colleagues. Make a voting plan. The midterm elections are coming up November 8th, so make sure you know how you're going to vote so that your ballot is cast. And remember, voting itself and registering to vote is not partisan activity. It's an act of citizenship. If you are eligible to vote, you should be registered to vote, and this is your opportunity to do it. Shout out to my friend and colleague, Dr. Ankita Sagar, who taught me this strategy several years ago. I learned it from her. Every talk I do now has this slide. Um, and so I would encourage all of you, please make sure you're registered to vote. And as leaders, make sure your teams are registered to vote and have a plan for how they're going to make sure their ballot is cast. So with all of that, I know it's a lot of information. I think we're going to have a rich discussion in the panel. My contact information is here as well. Please do feel free to reach out. You can email me. You can hit me on social media. Again, this is not easy work. This is generational stuff for us. It's a really big opportunity, and I'm delighted to be a part of it. And I'm, I'm honestly, I think it's remarkable that Common Spirit is such a large organization in the United States has really decided to take this plunge and, and drive this work forward. So I'm honored to be here, and I thank all of you very, very much. Uh, Mark, number one, thank you. Absolutely great. Uh, you've grown up to be a mensch. Good job, Mark. <laughs> I appreciate you, Gary. That's really kind of you to say. That's for those of you in the audience. Gary and I have known each other since I was a very, very small person. I've, I've been fortunate to count Gary and, and his family as close family friends for many, many years of my life. Uh, he has helped form my worldview, and it's an honor to be able to work with him today. Uh, sweet, around the block. <laughs> so, uh, right. great conversation. Thank you so much. And I, I did want to frame this that. Uh, since the flurry of mass shootings earlier this year, uh, the physician enterprise has really sort of committed to what is our space, so to speak, in, in this dialogue. And you're part of that. And um, working with Laura, we have uh, been, I think, a bit of a, on a journey. And that journey has included um, interviewing multiple stakeholders, working with Laura on special projects, and actually interviewing national organizations to see where we fit. Javi is one, um, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, ending family fire is another, uh, working with the Ad Council. And we have more conversations with those folks uh, next week. And so we are finding our place. And, and um, this uh, is really an inaugural grand rounds um, around this topic, uh, which we hope to have at least quarterly as we go forward in the year. Uh, with more topics related to gun safety. Uh, and, and we are working with various groups, particularly our Pediatric Ambulatory Collaborative around something called ACE screening, Adverse Childhood Event Screening, and assuring that um, gun safety as part of those childhood uh, well visits uh, for kids. So I, I just, uh, I, I think it's, it's a constellation of activities which you really, um, uh, I think helped us understand. I, I don't know that I have a question uh, yet, but um, I just wanted to share the context that, that this is happening in. 
maybe I can jump in, <clears throat> jump in with some questions. Um, and also just maybe a thanks and shout out, you know, Gary, thank you for taking the leadership with Ankara on this. And I think it does fall, it, to me, this falls under evidence-based standards in promoting health and well-being, and that we really, whatever we do, we're going to do it in a, in a clinically standard and evidence-based fashion. Uh, and that's kind of my background, and, and I'm passionate, whether it's, you know, screening for colonoscopies or, you know, gun safety, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do this in a way that makes some sense. I'm going to comment on a couple of things, you know, Mark, that um, as someone, you know, really spent most of my time as a clinician educator, one of the things, you know, I think about the early days of um, when we were trying to train, you know, residents on how to talk to patients about living wills and healthcare proxy. And you use the term that I just want, maybe, I'm, there's not really a question, but it's a re-emphasis and I'll let you reflect on it. And that's the normalization of it. Um, we used to say, you know, oh, Dr. McGinn, I can't, talk to my patients about a living will, they're going to think they're dying, you know, that's just not, you know, that's, they're going to, they're going to get all scared about their illness. And I said, well, just say, hey, you know, excuse me, you know, Mr. Smith, but with every one of our patients, we ask this question, you know, just sort of coming up with little, little phrases that, you know, facilitate normalization and make it part of our screening, you know, itinerary versus, you know, I'm coming to you to talk about, you know, guns. Um, so Mark, I don't, I don't know if you want to reflect on that or just, I, I just, the minute you said that, I was like, I, I, that's such a critical word that you use and it's very intentional how you use it. Yeah. I just want to highlight yeah. it. Yeah, no, I appreciate you calling that out. And, I, and, that, uh, and it was used with intention. I think that as we work to get better at this, and I'll be perfectly honest, I still like, I'm, I'm a fairly conflict averse person. This is still work for me too. Um, I've learned a lot about the topic, but when I'm actually in the hospital rounding and admitting and discharging, having these conversations, I have to kind of take a breath and think about it and have situational awareness that, you know, this may not go very well, or they might get angry with me. The first thing that for as, a, as the person on the kind of um, uh, activating side of this, the starting the process, my approach, um, and I've learned this from a lot of pediatricians who actually do this work, because there's a good amount of data and there's a lot of toolboxes uh, from the pediatric literature. And there's also, I should shout out too, from UC Davis, there's a really good online site and I'll send it to um, Gary and Ankita so that they can share it with all of you. It's free. And it's basically a toolbox of talking points of giving yourself some nomenclature and some statements that you can use as you go forward. The biggest thing is it just needs to fit into the normal rhythm of conversation. If it starts off with a drum roll and fire, I like that. Okay, I like that. We're gonna normal, talk firearms. I mean, the normal rhythm of, con I mean, that is so yeah. important. But I, I would challenge you the flip side of that is that it can't sound like a bit like a list of like 20 things that you're just trying right. to get through quickly. That's so right. That's there's right. a balancing act it's like, oh, you know, are you colonoscopy, you know, seatbelts, gun storage, you know, it's, right. it, you know, so while on we one hand, we have sincerity, meaning. we do it with meaning. And that is part of the art of this, right? It's, it's yeah. part of being agile and being in the arena because every encounter is going to be a little bit different, right? Somebody's going to just, yep, yep, nope, nope, yep, yep. Some people are going to say, wait, you just asked me about what? These things are going to happen. But the starting point, just again, to try to, again, normalize it, fit it into your regular routine with your regular approach, your regular algorithm. It, it lowers barriers for us to start the conversation and then just have situational awareness and be ready to be agile and be responsive and use appreciative listening and use the tools that, you know, excellent teachers such as all of you can provide to us as that conversation moves forward. Most of the time in my experience, and I would love to hear what others think who have done this, patients welcome it. The vast majority of the time, hey, thank you for asking. No one's ever actually asked me about that before. I don't have a firearm in my home. Okay, I appreciate that. Let's move on. Sometimes, yeah, we have one and we have a conversation. I usually learn more from those conversations than the patient does because I learn about their particular living context. I hear more about the impact of a wildfire that we had and the unstable housing they've experienced and where they put their firearms. I learn more about what's going on for them and their, their social determinants of health than they're learning from me about secure storage. So it's a real opportunity for us to expand all of the work that we want to do to take care of people. I wanted to ask a question because a lot of this framing is around what we as individual providers are doing um, to really help our patients navigate this a lot, right? And our learners navigate and role model. Um, Laura, I wanted to ask you from the health system perspective, what are the things that Common Spirit's working on so that to support this conversation that we're having one-on-one -on -one with our patients? 
Absolutely. Thank you so much. I'll just um, take a moment to talk about our United Against Violence initiative. It is an initiative that's over 10 years old, um, and we address multiple forms of violence uh, using a multifaceted strategy, really understanding and we're hearing it right now too, that there's no singular solution to violence. We have to approach every issue with a, with a spectrum of prevention techniques. So at the system level, we think of that in, in these four buckets. We do education and awareness. We do public policy advocacy, shareholder advocacy, and then we have community-based violence prevention programs for which we um, have our own uh, evidence-informed model um, that we've been using for over 10 years, and we've seen really, really make significant reductions in many areas of violence. And certainly we are seeing gun violence um, tick up ever more right now um, and seeing communities that have been dealing with other forms of violence setting, suddenly needing to, um, to also address gun violence in this work. So, so we do that. Um, we, we work with, uh, and our shareholder advocacy, I'll just say, um, I love that you talked about gun safety. We're very careful with that too. As, as large institutional investors, we can um, use our influence to hopefully move corporate America. So we have tried to engage even there on gun violence, right? So we've worked with credit card companies and shipping companies about ghost guns and asking them, you know, is there something better you could do rather than putting Visa right there on the on the uh, online place where you can buy a ghost gun? Um, and we've worked with the weapons manufacturers um, in a, a very bold move. We've done this from since FY16. Uh, we filed in 2018, FY18, um, a resolution asking Sturm Ruger to do um, a, a report on gun safety. We wanted to just know because we don't have a lot of information. Uh, we wanted to know what they were doing to develop maybe safer products, um, to track violent events, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's important. The reason we've done this is what we also understand is we can't, no one individual or organization or sector can do this alone. It takes everyone. And, and one of the groups we don't often see at the table of stakeholders are the gun manufacturers. So this is really an effort to try to involve them. Um, they, they make the product, so we try, we try to involve them um, in these dialogues. We filed again this year um, asking Sturm Ruger to do a human rights impact assessment. Um, and we did try to dialogue. We have dialogue with this company, by the way. So again, through that lens of gun safety, saying we are not anti-Second Amendment, we are not anti-gun, we are simply again, we, we are for gun safety and gun violence prevention. So we even dialogued with them. We couldn't come to terms this year. So that that proposal did go for a vote, and we got 68.5% of shareholder support for it. So it's it's we're we're very hopeful that they will do this, and we continue to tell them that we really we want to work in partnership, and that's the way we should approach everything, right? You know, in our communities, in our facilities, you know, this is going to take a group effort, um, and it's going to take calm and collectedness, normalizing the conversation, and putting it through the lens of gun safety and gun violence prevention. Yeah, I I think that's. Right, Laura, and and right on target. And I, I think the other thing is is um, as as Mark, as you were sort of walking through the uh, the drill for clinicians, for physicians, and advanced practice people, I, I sort of thought like, in a way, they're swimming in a lake by themselves, asking these questions. Like nobody else ever asked me this. Um, and I and I think one of the things that we've learned by working with Laura and 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 working with these national organizations is that we need to change the national narrative. Uh, and so the work that N Family Fire Fire is doing, the the Brady Organization uh, and the Ads Council, um, there are great ads, and we will attach some of those uh, video ads uh, to to this um, presentation when we send it out in the Physician Enterprise Bulletin um, that have a uh, a father talking to his six-year-old and the six-year-old is lecturing his father like you know I'm really glad you have that gun under the bed because you know if you're not home I, I need to defend the family here and the father goes what what are you talking about I know it's under there well no it's it's locked up no and I know where the ammunition is too and and this is a video and the father is you know like dropping his cup of coffee so I think that there needs to be a more national conversation and context for the clinicians to swim in that lake well. 
and, uh, so that I, they're not just I want to I want to stand right next to all of you with this point it's one thing for McGinn or Sagar or Shapiro to be on social media saying this is really important but when an organization the size of common spirit or hopefully the rest of our healthcare organizations step in underneath their logo underneath that flag that's a whole different sport that is a whole different sport now it's multi-billion dollar organization talking to multi-billion dollar organization they listen they'll listen right uh, there's a much better chance of listening. 68.5 percent of shareholders wanted to participate. That's a big deal. I didn't wouldn't have expected that number to be that yeah. high. So the more we can do this, and the more the example that you all are setting, being courageous and stepping into this tension is is critically important. No one is doing this yet, and as more and more do it, I think that that will hopefully have more effect. The other thing too is imagine right we're we're really good at marketing in our profession. We put our banners up in the waiting areas that say we're a center of excellence for X, Y, or Z. Imagine if we had a banner up in all of our hospitals that said, ask us about secure storage. We have gun locks. Come to the front desk if you want a gun lock. Whoever does that first will be the first to ever do it, and they will get national attention in a good way. They will get positive attention for doing so. Um, that is an opportunity for all of us. And I, I think that it's, it's all there for the taking. The other place for us to really think about where we partners with insurance companies. One of the things I didn't mention about the, the act that passed in Florida in 2011, it's a one-page law, which is weird for a law. There's a clause in it that also forbade insurance companies from using anything about firearms in any actuarial table. They could not use owner, firearm ownership in any way of any type of insurance issued in the state of Florida. So if we, that shows, I think it's a good illustration of the power that insurance companies can have to drive behavioral change around this. So that's yeah. another opportunity, a place for it that does not require legislation, um, that doesn't require a political lever. That just requires us communicating with our partners in the insurance industry to say, look, we really need your help. We know that insurance changes and actuarial table changes around behaviors drives behavioral change. Can we please start to partner around something that 44% of Americans live with right now. That is, what are, what are we talking about? 150 million people. That is a very powerful opportunity for us. We already partner with them on so many issues. This should be one of them. You know, Mark, the, the this issue of physicians being out there on their own and now having health systems join in, you know, insurance companies join in. Um, I mean, and, and as you talked about the Dickey Amendment, which I'm painfully aware of having applied for grants uh, to do research in this space and, and finally getting one um, after that, after the reinterpretation of it. And um, just having publications out there in the literature, um, you know, kind of helps us all become normal. It's another normalization process that it's okay to research about this. It's okay to ask patients about this. And I think there was a New England Journal publication that just came out looking at California, I believe. And you know, just the risk factor of having a gun at home puts you with three times risk of having, you know, gun violence in your, in your, in your, in your immediate family. And just back to the question, if we knew, if that would put the, take the gun out and put something else in, if you have cigarettes in the house, you're three times more likely to be injured. If you have this, we would all be asking a question like, Hey, do you have that in your house? And what are you doing about it? Like, we wouldn't be like walking on eggshells. We'd be there's Second very time. few things that increase your risk by three like right. that. It was very, the evidence was so clear. Um, so the challenges it was normalized. I think the publications help. I agree with you. That, that paper from Dr. Kellerman is from 1993. I mean, that's old. Let's be fair. That's old. That's two generations ago or one and a half, I guess. One of the challenges though, when we think about screening, and this is another opportunity for us to improve together, we are usually the subject matter expert when we're talking with a patient or their family around colorectal cancer screening, or as Dr. Birch pointed out in the Q&A, COVID vaccination. On the subject of firearms, the chance that the person who actually owns the firearm or possesses the firearm in their home, when a physician or a healthcare professional talks with them about it, they most likely know more about it than we do. Most healthcare professionals don't know a heck of a lot about firearms because it's not part of our routine training. We don't know there's a, obviously a wide spectrum, and I don't mean to generalize too much. It's an opportunity for improvement. We should not assume that physicians and healthcare professionals are subject matter experts when it comes to talking about secure storage and how to remove a magazine, how to clear the chamber, how to check the gun lock, how to do those things safely, how to reload your firearm when you decide, hey, I want to go practice. I want to go to the range and I want to do some target shooting, which is a really fun activity, totally legal. Um, how do we do those things? How do we talk about that with patients? We want to make sure that we, again, have that shared understanding on what do these terms mean? How do these things work? And the place that is the best at it by far, by far, is the United States military. 
the teaching that happens in uh, uniform services institutions around firearms, not only because they carry them, but because they're going to talk about them is rigorous. Dr. Kellerman, that's what he does for a living. Um, owning a firearm and using a firearm in the United States military on active duty or reserve duty is way more strict than the rest of the country. But the professionals that talk with members of the United States Armed Services uh, are way more well-versed in how these tools work so that they can have effective conversations. And that is an opportunity for improvement for us. But I do think, you know, that there's a lot of things that uh, our physicians on APPs are not experts in necessarily, but they can come from a place of both vulnerability, but also authenticity to ask that question. And one of the things I wanted to piggyback on that was said earlier was around you know, the fact that three times increased risk within that household. And I think that data is really morphing more now. Um, I'm not sure if we're able to pull up the slide about the latest CDC data that showed the exponential rise in firearm related suicide as well as firearm related homicide. So let me see if we are able to pull that up really quick. So I, wanna, I wanted to focus our conversation on this just a little bit because you could tell that there's this exponential increase. So when we think about not just the suicides and the homicides that are completed, but all the ones that were not completed and resulted in injury, it's very much part of our everyday conversation when we're doing preventive screenings to screen for suicide and depression. So thinking about firearm storage from that context may also be very important. And I think we have a question. Um, how do we engage our patients and communities who are disproportionately affected by gun violence? And I think this could go to Laura and Mark, both of them. Sure. I want to hear what Laura has to say. Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, we really need to be in our communities because, you know, to your point about the those were the successful um, firearm deaths. I, I found out recently in trying to dig for data in our own system in FY21, we had 3200 incidences of both um, uh, intentional and accidental injuries in our facilities, completely preventable, completely preventable. Um, and and so in addition to thinking about safe storage and, and all the things that we could screen patients for inside too, the social determinants of health aspect is incredibly important. And we need to be really investing in, and Common Spirit does, we need to invest in looking into why it's happening to begin with. Let's go upstream. And why are people falling through the hole in the bridge upstream? Why, you know, and, and we're getting better at getting data where we can target where there's a hot spot, so to speak. We, we need to invest in that kind of prevention. It's actually, um, first of all, life saving, um, soul saving, and cost saving. And so, you know, anything you can do as a provider to support those kinds of efforts, your voice matters. Let me tell you, I'm so thrilled to be working with Physician Enterprise on this because. I need your voices. I need your support backing the work that we do in our communities as well um, so that we can expand it and enhance it. Uh, I wanna just do a time check for us. I think we're getting near the end. Uh, there's some great uh, conversation that took place in the Q&A between Dr. Jackson and Dr. Shapiro and uh, we will capture that. And Mark, thank you for the, um, uh, for the references, for the links. Um, one thing about uh, Mark is he's an excellent multitasker as he's answering the questions and that's perfect. Uh, but but I, I think that it's great information and uh, Dr. Jackson, thanks for asking that question. And, and I, I would just close and say, thank you so much. I, I think there's a lot of, um, to your point, electricity and voltage around this. And, and just one thing I thought of, and I don't know where I heard this, but um, uh, I, I've, um, I heard the story of a mom dropping her kid, uh, kid off five, six years old uh, at someone's house to play with their five or six year old and asking, do you have firearms in the house? Uh, and if so, are they safe? And so I would just leave folks with that thought. Um, but, but clearly this is about a national conversation that we need to have um, that uh, creates in a way a safety net for the clinicians as well to have these conversations along with everyone else. It shouldn't just be our job 
but it is our job. So with that, uh, Tom, any last words, Ankara? Just thanks to to our guests for coming in and and, yes, and thank you, Laura. And thanks being, being along the ride for with us on this. You know, it's it's a it's really uh, important work. So thank you. Uh, with that, we hope people have a great and restful weekend and a safe weekend uh, on multiple levels. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll see folks soon. This will be in the bulletin uh, with a link to share with all of your colleagues.